We know that when President Biden is doing anything in public, he is Bidening. And what I define Bidening as is he's doing bipartisan things. It's what he does. It's innate in him. He is. It's very hard, I think, for him to be very hard charging and political. But he has been over the past, you know, really since this summer. He's talked about the MAGA movement very pointedly. He's named them and named them as what's endangering our republic. Are you surprised that he didn't do that tonight? You know, we're so close to this election, but the message that he was giving was to essentially give a lot of grace to the Republican Party and say, I know this is not the majority of the party, and to say that we need to come together, we need to unify around these ideas, America is an idea. This was a call for unity. Were you surprised that he didn't make some of the points that you heard Congressman Raskin make, that, look, if you want to be able to empower the people in D.C. who don't have a vote, you need Democrats to win. If you want, you know, to be able to give women the rights over their own bodies, you need Democrats to win. Are you surprised that wasn't in his speech? No, because I think he's actually trying to have an effect on the election. So, first of all, it's not lost on anybody who either watches the speech or sees the coverage uh, who's on each side <laughs> of this question. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of Republicans, not all Republicans. I mean, just yesterday, Joy, the candidate for governor in Wisconsin, Tim Nichols, the Republican candidate, said, if I win this election, Republicans will never lose another election in Wisconsin. Captures the threat as well as anything anyone's ever said. So I think what, what the, the message the president was trying to, I think, send today was, if you are a Republican or if you're a Republican-leaning independent, help us save democracy. And you're not going to probably be effective in asking them to do that if you absolutely uh, torpedo, uh, you know, the other party. So I think what he's saying is, let's make common cause safe democracy. Then we can get back to fighting about tax rates and how yeah. we pay for health care and all the things that have been part of our country's history. So I, I think it was a smart approach, and that's what we need. Uh, and it, it greatly concerns me that you have some large tens of millions of Republicans and Republican-leading independents who actually believe the winner of elections should win them who doesn't agree with the big lie, but most of them seem intent on supporting election deniers. Uh, and that concerns me as a citizen, because we are not going to be safe until enough Republicans make common cause with Democrats and then ultimately nominate Republicans who are not a threat to democracy in their primaries. Yeah, and on that on that note, this is a good time to bring in political analyst Matthew Dowd. He's back. He's the chief. He was the chief strategist of the Bush Cheney 2004 presidential campaign, a campaign I remember well, Matthew, because I was working in campaign politics. I had left the news business, and I can remember that loss, your victory, your campaign's victory, being incredibly painful. I am being in a room with people who had worked their hearts out, who had thrown everything, given all they had uh, in the belief that George W. Bush should not be the president of the United States any longer. Many of us were very deeply opposed to the war in Iraq. It was the reason that I got involved in the first place. But in the end, what we had to all do was to accept that he was going to be the president of the, of the United States for four more years. There was no one around me, as many tears as you saw in those, in those rooms, saying, I'm just going to pretend he's a hologram and that he's not the real president and that there were, you know, children buried in the in the in the, you know, in the White House. And it, it, the thing is, the challenge here is that it is a Republican problem. And at some point, someone who is a Republican um, or who is who still has standing with them has got to call them off because it's getting worse and worse. As you just said, as David Bluff just said, they're saying that they will ensure that they never lose again. They will ensure their base that they always win. That's not democracy. That's dictatorship. Yeah, and and the one the Republicans that have stood up in their primaries, almost every single one of them have lost. Liz That's Cheney right. being point evidence, and so the only the only accountability left since the Republican Party refuses to hold their own members accountable or put any guardrails on this at all, as, as the president described, is the general election, is the general election, which is a very dicey affair because we're a country that is very polarized, that is very not only demographically polarized, but geographically polarized. And it puts it in, us in a situation where that's the last thing left. I don't think this is going to move Republicans, and I don't think that was the president's goal at all mm -hmm. in this. 
I think this speech, one, was something from his heart that he, you know, from, from believes completely. I've actually, with, listening to his speech, I was thinking about the transition the president has made in the last two years, because I think he was very, in the initial phases, had this idea of, I'm going to work with the Republicans. There's a bunch of good Republicans. I'll work with them. It's all fine. Democracy's safe. We got it. Everything's fine. That's how he sort of operated for a while. And then it took him a while to get to this speech, it, mm -hmm. it understanding reality and seeing, oh, my gosh, there isn't a Republican Party that's sane in this country today in the midst of this. But again, this is on the voters right now. This is on the voters. I can blame candidates and campaigns and all of that. And I think many of them should have run better campaigns in the midst of this and had a more disciplined message in this on this message that the president just elicited tonight. But it's up to the voters. 120 million plus will vote in total by November 8th. That's my guess. And it's really up to them. Because, as the president said, and I firmly believe this, we're on a knife's edge. And Trump and his supporters, like Michael Ludig said, the, the conservative Republican judge said, are a clear and present danger to the United States of America. And this is a great time to bring you back in, Jen, because, you know, you worked as press secretary and you had to face off with some of the right wing media. So you understand full well the incentive structure that's built in on the right for the media that serves that public is to never accept what Joe Biden says, right? Is to never accept an election. I mean, the, on one of the other channels there, they're already saying that Bolsonaro really won, that that election was stolen. It's mm -hmm. a constant churning cycle that keeps a certain percentage of our population captive. And so they're never allowed out of the box of saying, if we don't win, if we don't guarantee that we win, then, you know, baby killing, you know, zombies are taking over the country. They've, they've invented every kind of, um, description for Democrats as inhuman monsters so that they are incentivized. It's We shouldn't have any of us been surprised that some of them showed up at the Capitol on January 6, 2021, because they're being told 24-7 that the only way to save America is that they must rule. They must rule forever. They must never lose an election. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, because the incentive structure in their media is to never allow President Biden to be the president of the whole United States. That's exactly right, Joy. And I think, you know, the president didn't talk a lot about the international side tonight, but he st it struck me when he said it's more than about government. It's about it's a way of being, a way of seeing the world. And he's somebody who sees this as an issue, as you touched on, Joy, around the world, authoritarianism versus democracy and what we need to preserve and protect. And when you look at, as you said, what you see some other networks doing or you see some crazy propaganda going on on social media right now, which I'm sure is happening happening. It's confusing. And it's the type of models you see in countries like Russia and China, where they're pushing uh, this confusing, authoritarian, one-sided view. And that is where we are headed. That is what the president is warning of and saying that if you, if we do not make a choice, if people do not stand up next week and moving forward, that is what could potentially happen. I'll also say that while he's not trying to speak to the Republican Party, certainly not, he's been around politics long enough to know that's not smart to do, he is always a person who's going to try to offer a bridge to Republicans who may be sitting out there, who may be worried about inflation or taxes, or maybe they're pro-life, whatever their issues are, to say, this is a moment, this is a defining moment. And I think that is also part of what he was trying to convey tonight. Uh, you know, David, it strikes me that President Biden, in a different way from Donald Trump, is a nostalgia politician, right? Mm -hmm. That he, he definitely is very sincere in his belief that the American experiment, but for a few flaws, is sound, that it's solid, and that it can be brought back. He seems to believe anyone can be brought back in the fold, and he operates that way, in a very gracious way. Um, it's not ever very rarely returned from the other side, but he does operate that way. Do you think, as somebody who's been in this game and, and done the political game uh, as, as long as, as, as any of us or any of, the, any of you guys that are on there, you guys are the experts, do you think that that kind of politics is even possible anymore? Or are we too far beyond the bend now that we could ever come back to a kind of politics where we just argue about tax cuts and whether what the tax code should look like and it's sort of normal? Or are we way past that in your view? 
Well, first of all, Joy, presidents are not political commentators or operatives. I mean, they've got a they've got a bigger responsibility. And I think basically whether you're talking about Biden, Obama, both Bushes, Reagan, Clinton, going all the way back, Trump is the outlier. Um, you know, we respected the rule of law. We respected institutions. Uh, when you lost an election, you conceded. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think a president has to speak to what the country's been, uh, and what it needs to remain. Obviously, it's an imperfect union, uh, but I think that the threat is so pronounced right now, Joy. I, listen, if we are a democracy on January 20th, 2025, my humble opinion is we will remain a democracy. I think that's very much an open question. Let's just look at what's happening now. So Matthew's a former pollster, he'll, he'll speak to this. Um, the Republicans may have a very good night next Tuesday, but what is being set up by some of these Republican polls, I'm sure some of them are done uh, to the letter of the industry. Others, I think, are garbage. But you see Fox and other networks basically setting up that the Republicans are heading for a landslide. Everything I'm seeing in early vote, the polling, suggests that Democrats very well uh, could have a decent night. We'll see. But if the Democrats do have a decent night, they're going to be screaming from the top of their lungs uh, that the election was stolen. And so what they've basically set up in this country is either Republicans win all the elections, as Michaels in Wisconsin said, or Democrats can only win an election where they win in a landslide. Uh, and so I think that is the danger here. Uh, and it's it's pumped in uh, through our phones and through people's computers and televisions nonstop. Uh, and so I think a president has to speak to these bigger issues. I don't think they can solely be a partisan warrior. So that's my answer, Joy, which is I'm not naively optimistic. All I'd say is if we are a democracy, January 20th, 2025, I think we will have escaped the worst. But I put that proposition, you know, 50-50. Uh, which is, you know, a hard thing to say in America, but that's where we are. 